The text this morning is taken from the Gospel of John, the first three verses. These are the words of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Our Father and great God, we ask you now for a great quickening. We ask that your spirit would be active and powerful in our midst today, moving with great authority, taking the words of Scripture and using them to have your way with us. Accomplish in us your good pleasure and will. And we ask this in the strong name of Jesus. And amen. Amen. Before turning to an exposition of the text, allow me to remind you of the arena where this text needs to be applied. This is what might be called an occasional sermon. The Canadian Parliament recently passed a law, a law called C4, that in effect outlawed any presentation of the saving gospel of Christ to those in the grip of certain sexual perversions. This legislation was plainly aimed at Christians, but whether it was or not, it just as plainly includes Christians. It just as plainly encompasses Christians. In response to this move, a number of Canadian pastors have chosen this Sunday to preach on the forbidden topic in violation of their new law and in simple obedience to the law of God. For those who need the reminder, the law of God always outranks the legal whims and legal delusions of men. Although the law does not affect us here in the States, the spirit of it most certainly does. And so a number of American pastors are also preaching on this same topic on the same day in solidarity with our Canadian brothers who are on the front line. This is not an instance of meddling in someone else's business, like taking a passing dog by the ears, Proverbs 26, 17. Twenty states in the United States have already banned conversion therapy, about which more in a moment. So 20 states have already done this thing. For reasons that will be made evident shortly, this is an issue that concerns absolutely everyone here. It is even more relevant to your children and your grandchildren. With that said, let us turn to a summary of the text. Always the text first. In the first chapter of Genesis, we are told that God said something. We there read, God said, let there be light, and there was light. That's Genesis 1-3. And of course, what God said was the word. This word of God was with God, and the word of God was God. Verse 1 of the Gospel of John. He did not come after God temporally in any sense. He was in the beginning with God, we're told, in verse 2. Everything that is created came into existence through this word, verse 3. Apart from him, nothing created has any possible existence apart from him. Verse 3. God the Father was the architect of all things, and we are told that God the Father in his speaking was the creator and maker of all things through the executive of his word. And so it was that the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the deep. This world is therefore a spoken world. This world came into existence through that word that was spoken. He is the word, and we are all his words. Whatever belongs to the created order, this word created it. That's in Colossians 1, 16 and 17. Through this word, God made all the worlds. That's in Hebrews 1, verse 2. And this spoken world only remains in existence because God continues to speak it. We are sustained by the word of his power. That's in Hebrews 1, 3. The word of his power. All created things are sustained by the word of his power. Remember that. And what is that power? He is the Almighty. He is omnipotent. He is the everlasting God. He is omniscient. He knows all things. The Word is therefore the Word of the Father's infinite and almighty power. Christ, the Word of His power. Now, what is our our circumstance? What is our situation? 
What is the location of the very peculiar corner that we've painted ourselves into? This new Canadian law outlaws what they are calling conversion therapy. I'm going to have a number of quotes here. I'm not going to bother to mark them. You can check the outline for where the quotations begin and end. They're outlawing what they call conversion therapy. And the way they define this objectionable behavior outlaws any attempt whatever to persuade a person with perverted sexual desires to repent of those desires. Not a sin yet to repent, but it is a sin to call for repentance. It's a sin, a crime, to call for repentance. Now it has come to pass that anyone guilty of violating this law is subject to imprisonment for a term of not more than five years. A term of not more than five years for calling someone in sexual sin of a particular kind to repent and turn from their sins. According to this law, conversion therapy refers to any practice treatment, or service that is designed to change a person's sexual orientation to heterosexual or to repress or reduce non-heterosexual attraction or sexual behavior, any attempt to reduce homosexual behavior, any attempt to interfere with it, not to mention seeking to change any number of other things that very likely need changing. But... To no one's surprise, the law does not prohibit conversion efforts running in the opposite direction. It does not prohibit a practice, treatment, or service that relates to a person's gender transition. That's all good. It is therefore illegal now to help someone climb the slope of sexual virtue in Canada, but it is by no means illegal to help them tumble down it and into the crevices of vice. It's legal to go one way, it's not legal to go the other. Now, the preamble of this wretched and misbegotten law declares, ex cathedra, that conversion therapy causes harm, that's their word, causes harm to those subjected to it. That conversion therapy causes harm to society because it is based on and propagates myths and stereotypes, oh no, It propagates myths and stereotypes about sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression, including the idea that heterosexuality, cisgender gender gender identity, and gender expression that conforms to the sex assigned to a person at birth are to be preferred over other sexual orientations, gender identities, and gender expressions. That's a mouthful, that's a word salad right there, and it's about as wrong-headed as a cathedral filled with unregenerate bishops could possibly be. In effect, they are telling us that for us to repeat the holy standards established by Almighty God causes harm because it perpetuates myths and stereotypes that run contrary to what these dogmatists think should be applauded by all. And if you refuse to go along with this nonsense, it is five years in the big house for you. A friend, Steve Wilkins, is saying he used to be against prison reform, but now he's thinking more and more about being in favor of prison reform because he's probably going to go. (laughs) Someone saw that you weren't applauding. Someone saw that you weren't applauding and started to ask pointed questions. You weren't enthusiastic about the vice. This law is important, so their argument goes, in order to protect human, the, the human dignity and equality of all Canadians. So how are we to respond? What are we to think of all this? Before we turn to examine it in detail, let's get the defiance part out of the way. We do not believe in some kind of heteronormativity grounded in human tradition but rather in theonormativity, grounded in the absolute law of God. And on the basis of that law, we here declare in the name of Jehovah that the image of God was established by the Creator Himself, imprinted on our race in a fundamental binary. That was done by God. So God created man in His own image. In the image of God created He Him, male and female, created he them. Genesis 1.27. This was 
His image, established by him at the very beginning, marred by us in the rebellion and fall, and which is now being restored in us through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Consequently, we consider this Canadian law to be just one more antichrist in a long line of antichrists, and we reject it as just one more antichrist. We reject the spirit of this law, and with high confidence in God, we issue the strongest possible defiance to this law. Together with that defiance, we believe it is our duty to issue the strongest possible warnings to those politicians and bureaucrats and law, law enforcement officials who are fomenting this nonsense. Psalm 94, verse 20 says, Shall the throne of iniquity have fellowship with thee, which frameth mischief by a law? All of our current cultural conflicts, most certainly including this one, boil down to this. This is a battle for the editorial control of the dictionary. And by dictionary, I mean the sum total of all our dictionaries. Our aspiring tyrannical mandatorians want to be granted, granted the authority to be allowed to define all words, and they want their defini definitions to stand uncontested. They want to seize the authority to jail any who use language in ways forbidden by them. Other definitions, regardless of their source, even if it's from Almighty God, are backhanded as myths, and not only myths, but forbidden myths. They have determined that it is high time for them to rise up and challenge the editor-in-chief, the one who gave us the ability to speak in the first place, and consequently the one who is the Lord over all our old dictionaries. As the giver of speech, he is the giver of dictionaries. He is the Lord of all the pronouns, he is the Lord of coherent speech, and we see in this, their incoherent speech, that he is the Lord of wrath also. We need to understand this effort of theirs as a new Babel. This is a linguistic ziggurat. They intend to defend themselves against what Jehovah did to them the last time, that is, by confusing their tongues, by seizing control of all language beforehand. If they are the editors of all the dictionaries, and if they can thereby control our speech, then plainly they have seized what they have lusted after for centuries. They were building a great tower of stones the last time when God interrupted, and God interrupted them by confusing their languages. Their language turned it into languages. So this time, as they vainly imagine, they have seized that weapon for themselves and they will outwit him, and they will build their new tower, new great tower, out of definitional elasticity. But who is it that they have decided to challenge in his position as the editor of all dictionaries? <coughs> Excuse me. Who are they taking on? His very name is the Word. He is the Word. They have decided that they are going to challenge the God of all dictionaries, the God of all languages, the one who fashioned Adam as a speaking creature. God gave the gift of speech, the gift of words, to the dust of the ground. They are going to wrestle for all or nothing, for exhaustive authority over words, and they're going to throw out this challenge to the word. They're going to do this on the lip of the abyss, on the edge of ultimate madness, on the threshold of the void, and they are demonstrating to us how the madness is already starting to set in. It's well advanced already. They've challenged the Almighty to a battle of words. They've challenged the font of speech itself to a duel of words. So if there's one thing that Christians should not be in the light of all this, it is anything like worried. This is like a five-year-old attacking Neptune with a water pistol. It is like trying to set the sun on fire with a box of wooden matches. It's like throwing a snowball at all the glaciers of Greenland. This is the supreme folly. It is demented. It is the latter half of the banquet at Belbury in C.S. Lewis's novel, That Hideous Strength. There is no reason for anxiety, Christian, because our adv adversaries have staked out their position plainly. They have said, blot your bull do, and they have warned us sternly that it is the law. 
Now, the Lord is the sovereign. The Lord of all is the sovereign over all things, obviously. But it, is, it has been his good pleasure to mediate his authority in the world through his church. He has made us kings and priests on the earth, Revelation 1.6, Revelation 5.10. And then in Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, it says this, And hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. This means that the answer that is coming to this particular frenzy on the part of our ruling elites is an answer that is going to proceed from the church. And when the church speaks, she does so from her pulpits with an open Bible laid out on those pulpits. And what do we say? The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. That word, above all earthly powers, no thanks to them, abideth. The spirit and the gifts are ours, through him who with us sideth. Mark that. No thanks to them abideth. But that word abides nonetheless. It abides despite their scorn and pretended sophistication. It abides. It abides despite their threats of five-year sentences. It abides despite their abandonment of common law, common grace, and common sense. It abides their inversion of all fixed categories. Isaiah 5.20 says, Woe to those who call good evil and evil good, who substitute light for darkness and darkness for light, up for down, down for up. The word abides. In 1943, when Churchill and Stalin and Roosevelt were discussing the shape of the post-war world, the story is told that someone suggested that the Pope might have something to contribute to their discussion. And Stalin is reputed to have said, The Pope, how many divisions has he? In this confrontation of ours, and it is a confrontation, the worldlings turn to us and they ask us what resources we might have. They have armies and navies. They have parliaments and conferences. They have international corporations and they have nuclear weapons. They have control of the monetary system. They have a hammerlock on the media. And they have many thousands of kept and fully house-trained scientists. And so they turn to us with a sneer. How many divisions do we have? And our answer is simple. We have words and water and bread and wine. That's what we have. Words, water, bread, and wine. And underneath all of it, we have the spirit of Jehovah. And that's all that's necessary. That's all that's needed. Now, the reason that all this is happening is because our ruling class is unregenerate. Our ruling class needs to be born again. They do not know God, and this is why their decisions and determinations and laws are shrouded in this peculiar kind of darkness. They dwell in darkness, and they hate the light. And why? Because their deeds are evil, John 3, 19. But what kind of power does darkness have when light is spoken to it? What happens whenever God says, let there be light? And what happens when God says, as he will say, let there be light again? In 2 Corinthians 4, 5 and 6, it says, For we preach preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness at the beginning, hath shined in our hearts at the beginning of our Christian lives to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. When God said, let there be light, to the darkness of nullity and non-existence, there was immediately light. But he has the same kind of authority when he speaks to a different kind of darkness, the darkness of this sin and rebellion. And when he speaks light to that kind of darkness, the same thing will happen. The same thing will happen. Light happens and the light does not come about the light does not come to be through a coincidence. No, the light appears because it is obedient. They will of course want to stop any word that has this kind of power. This word has the power to stop them 
in their tracks. This word has authority. Any word that has that kind of authority, they're going to want to stop. They're going to want to do something about it. And they will try to stop it by locking up preachers. Let them. Binding preachers is a whole lot easier than tying up their message. 2 Timothy 2.9 says, Wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. The Apostle Paul was locked up more than once, and the word of God has not been locked up yet. It does not matter whether our ruling elites have scheduled a great reformation and revival. We know that they have not. It does not matter that they have not written down anything like that on their calendars. What matters is whether it is on God's calendar. And all the prophets from Samuel on declare that it is in fact on God's calendar. So it does not matter to us that the darkness has not planned for an eruption of light. They have not planned on it. They have nothing to do with what is going to happen. They have no authority and less sense. They thought the little dwarf star of the church was about to flicker and go out little realizing that it was actually God's appointed place for the next supernova. And so here is the light that they've passed a law against. Here is the outlawed light. This is the message that they don't want you to hear. Jesus is Lord. Caesar is not Lord. Jesus is the creator of all things, and it is his will that all little girls grow up to be women. It is his will that all little boys grow up to be men. Radical, I know. This is his purpose. His is his, this is his purpose, his intention, and design. It is that the love between Christ and the church be embodied and modeled by a man and a woman coming together in fruitful union. That is a picture of the gospel, and nothing else is. This is his will. And we are commanded to listen to his will because he is the one who rose from the dead. The cabal of crooked politicians in his day conspired to have him railroaded in a joke trial in the middle of the night, condemned to death, and hanged on a gibbet. While he was hanging there, the diseased politicians of his day came to the foot of the cross in order to taunt him. We have politicians like that today. If he were hanging there today, they would be at the foot of the cross taunting him in just the same way. Come down, they said. Come down, and then we will believe. If you come down from there, if you show us a a miracle on our terms, then we will believe. But it was not his purpose to come down. He was going to go down, down to the grave, and from that place, he was going to come up. We do not follow the one who came down from the cross. We follow the one who came up from the grave. Do you not see? And as the one who came up from the dead, he is now established on his throne as the Lord of all things. In the first place, he is now the Lord of crooked politicians, and he will dispense with them as he pleases. God has established him in his great office as the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead. As it says in Romans 1.4, Christ is established as the judge of the whole earth, which includes all these pitiful lordlings, and God established him in that role by raising him from the dead, Acts 17.31. The word tells us that the Lord Jesus will judge the world in righteousness. He will judge the world in righteousness and not in demented folly. He is the Lord of the crooked and the Lord of the straight. And he knows how to make the crooked straight. He is the Lord of kings and congresses. He is the Lord of princes and parliaments. He is the Lord of boys and girls, men and women. He is the Lord of marriage. He is the Lord of darkness and the Lord of light. He is the Lord of the secular carnival funhouse of mirrors they've got going. He is the Lord of love and the Lord of hate. He is the light and he is love. He is the Lord of oceans and the Lord of the dry land. He is the Lord of holiness And the day is coming when holiness to the Lord will be inscribed on the smallest of things, down to the bells of the horses, as Zechariah tells us. You may be a member of parliament. You may be a member of parliament who supported and voted for this monstrosity. 
You may be a faceless functionary in some bureaucracy gearing up to enforce it. You may be an intelligence analyst who thinks that your grasp of data rivals the omniscience of God. You may be a Canadian pastor who's trying to figure out how to compromise on this without looking like you're compromising. You may be a soft evangelical think leader who's trying to figure out how to configure all of this as somehow not a gospel issue. And yet, another lamentable exercise, you think, in conspiracy thinking by conservative Christians. It doesn't actually really matter who you are. It doesn't really matter who you are because if Christ summons you with his inexorable and efficacious word, then you will come. You can come to Christ from anywhere, and it, whether you come or not is not really up to you. you. What side you're on, this is a great conflict, and what side you're on in this great conflict is not yours to determine. It's not your place. You are born under the wrath of God, born into a sinful race, and that's where you will remain unless God in his sovereign purpose calls you out like he did Saul of Tarsus. If he turns to you, looks straight at you, and summons you with the Spirit of God, summons you with the very finger of God with which he points at you, what will you say? And if he then says, come, follow me, that is what you will in fact do. He is the word, and he has spoken. He has said, follow me. And I, as a minister of his word, am speaking in his name and on his behalf. Not only am I authorized to do so, I am under obligation to do so. You are now summoned. Christ was crucified, died, and was buried, and he rose from the dead, and so you are now summoned. And the spirit and the bride say, come, and let him that heareth say, come, and let him that is athirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely, as it says in Revelation twenty-two seventeen. And when you come to the light, you will leave the darkness behind. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Our Father and gracious God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit's work in our hearts. I pray that you would use this in our lives, in our families. I pray that you would be uh, kind to those Canadian pastors who are on the front line right now. I pray that your kindness would bestow on them a boldness that's straight from you. I pray that you'd grant them a Holy Ghost backbone. Father, I pray you do all this because we're asking for it in the name of Jesus, and he is the one who taught us to pray, saying, The gospel humbles the proud and exalts the humbled. Nowhere is that more evident than when we come to the Lord's Supper. The pride of man thinks that the more you earn, the greater your fame, the more talented you are, the better your spot at the table, and the better portions you should receive. The table of the haughty insists that you must earn a spot at the table. The fellowship of the self-righteous is tenuous, however. They must continually adjust for popular opinions about what constitutes moral behavior. They fence the table by conforming to the fads of the time. The haughty heart wants its sins overlooked, while others, whose sins just recently became detestable according to public opinion, must be left out. But this table, where the signs of our Lord's humiliation are brought to view, rebukes everyone's sins, petty and trite sins, to criminal and deranged sins, murder and envy, lust and sodomy, lying and defrauding, laziness and bank heists. Christ died, not so that we could smuggle our sins into his banqueting hall and hide them under the table. He died so that we need carry our sin and our guilt no more. The humble have had their eyes opened by grace to see the horrendous grotesqueness of their sin and the holy glory of Christ's sacrifice for that sin. The humble say amen to the evil of their sin and say another amen twice as loud to the forgiveness and eternal life offered to them in the gospel. And so, to all the world, to sinners of all stripes, to the child who tells habitual lies, to the businessman who rages at his employees, to the cross-dresser, the stripper, and the self-righteous Pharisees, the word, of the, the word of the gospel is this. Come. Come here and leave your sin there. And so come in faith and welcome to Jesus Christ. Let us pray. 
Our Father, we thank you for the assurance of pardon and righteousness and mercy which we receive through this bread, which is Christ's body broken for us, and this wine, which is Christ's blood shed for us. We receive these signs and the grace they bring, all by the faith which your Spirit has begotten in us. And we give thanks for it all, in Jesus' name, and amen. The charge is this, the Western world has come to a crossroads and the thing that has to be said to the Western world at that crossroads is what Elijah said to everyone assembled on Mount Car Carmel. If Jehovah is God, if Yahweh is God, follow him. If Baal is God, follow him. But you can't split the difference anymore. You can't have it both ways. You've got to go one way or the other. And the good news is Christians who confess that Jesus is Lord, that is our fundamental confession. That fundamental confession means that if Jesus is Lord, then Caesar is not. If Jesus is Lord, then Caesar is not. And that fact is not altered when Caesar loses his mind, right? which has happened more than once. When Caesar just goes around the bend, that just accentuates the truth. Christ is Lord. Christ is Lord. Follow him. So with believing hearts, receive the benediction of your God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.